Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Tony Incalcaterra, Senior Vice President with Ipsos's Audience Measurement Team. Tony, you have the floor. Thank you, Ellen, and it's a pleasure to see everybody today. So thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to uncover the critical elements of uh, corporate social responsibility, um, commonly known as CSR. Now, obviously, CSR impacts everyone regardless of income, but it's particularly important to understand the connection between corporate social responsibility actions that are taken by companies with their most influential consumers, and those are affluent Americans. So, you know, for some time in these webinars, we've talked about the power uh, and their controlling almost three quarters of the U.S. net worth. Uh, but the fact is they outspend their non-affluent counterparts two to one across virtually every consumer category. Uh, but frankly, uh, there's even further importance to managing the expectations of affluence. And that's because they, they show support for companies they favor in two ways. Uh, not surprisingly, first, by making purchases. Uh, half of affluence would rather buy from companies that actively support their community, even if it would be more expensive. Uh, they do that by being informed about company policies. You know, a third of affluence regularly make an effort to investigate a company's environmental or social record. So they're, they're highly attuned to how companies operate. Now, secondarily, affluence vote with their investments and their stock ownership. So 44% of affluence own stock in companies other than the companies they work for. Uh, and they're not passive, they're actually active investors, with two-thirds of them making security transactions in the past 12 months. So today, we're going to delve pretty deeply into what CSR really means to affluence um, and how their perception of companies are, are impacted by the public programs, the communications from those companies. We're going to talk about the elements of social responsibility that are really the most critical for companies to keep in mind. Uh, next, we're going to highlight the differences between men and women when it comes to important policies, you know, really the, the policies that companies should pursue. You know, and of course, we're, we'll need to look at how generational differences are going to impact the way that companies set up programs uh, and their inherent, in, uh, inherent importance as time goes on. Um, from there, we'll talk about the political divide. Uh, not surprisingly, like most things in the U.S. these days, where you sit on the political spectrum really covers colors your viewpoint about CSR. Um, and, and finally, we're going to bring all of this back uh, to try to uh, essentially come up with some salient points that are going to sum up the importance and the pitfalls of corporate social responsibility. But before we get into the presentation, before we get any further, I, I wanted to make sure to explain who we are and why we're able to bring you these insights today. So Ipsos Affluent Intelligence is, is really born out of our 45 years studying the most highly sought after consumers in America. Uh, it was it is the longest running and most widely used study of affluence in the United States. Originally, some of you may know it as the Monroe Mendelssohn study, uh, purchased by Ipsos 14 years ago, and then rechristened the Ipsos Affluence Study. We migrated the study online in 2015, uh, so now we have online data collection. That enables us to make significant improvements to the, uh, to the survey regularly. Uh, it also allows us to create custom recontact capabilities for clients. Um, and these are you know, relatively short surveys uh, that can come preloaded with really many thousands of data points that we've already collected of those respondents. Uh, the survey itself is in field 24-7, virtually 365 days a year. Uh, we release studies in spring and fall of each year that combine 12 months of continuous data. And then in addition, we release a double base every summer, the most recent one just a few weeks ago, uh, that combines two years worth of interviewing. Uh, and that allows for larger sample sizes uh, so that you can develop insights on low incidence categories. Uh, 
you know, today we're going to be talking about information from one of our quarterly barometers, uh, which many of you are familiar with. And these are surveys where we recontact respondents to the core affluence study. Uh, and that enables us to, to gather some in-depth insights on a, a range of subjects, you know, from finances, travel, uh, their general outlook in life, smart home technology, so on and so on. The insights we're going to present today are really derived from two sources, our ongoing Ipsos Affluent Survey in the U.S., uh, along with a recontact of respondents to the Affluent Survey that we conducted at the end of 2020. So just to be clear, corporate social responsibility is really all about the business practices that companies uh, have that contribute to the betterment of society as a whole. You know, whether these programs are philanthropic in nature, environmental or green, uh, whether they're activism for social causes or, or simply the fact that the company's um, pursuing ethical and sound policies, it really all wraps up into CSR. So, you know, setting aside a, a formal description of, of corporate social responsibility, there are really multiple opinions of what it really means uh, and whether or not it's a worthy goal for companies to pursue. We're going to cover some key aspects that are both positive and negative uh, that will go into um, the type of program that that company should have and we're going to go into that in more detail but but first i thought it would be important for everyone to hear directly from affluence unaided um, about what corporate social responsibility is and isn't so for many it's about holding companies accountable you know particularly as it relates to employees and customers it's about doing the right thing pursuing policies that benefit society, even if these policies are purely altruistic and don't benefit the company in any direct financial means. Now, many affluents feel that it is the responsible thing to do, that companies have a duty to develop and follow policies that protect the environment and actually do something to improve it. And it's about caring about caring more uh, than just about the operating profit. So good corporate citizenship is about being a smart business that also looks after the locale. So summing up on the good side, it's about pursuing the righteous path uh, that blends both being good to employees by promoting equality, good benefits, and having a corporate mission that includes a smart business plan, um, the one that focuses on more than just simply making money. Now, all of that said, you know, we should point out that there are skeptics among the affluent population. So while many people want companies to take ownership of their impact in the world, some do see this through cynical shades. So if companies aren't careful, and if they don't pursue honest policies, their public stances can come across as insincere. You know, one example of this is uh, something called greenwashing or, or green sheen. And it's basically a form of marketing spin in which green public relations and green marketing are seen as being deceptive and simply used to persuade the public that an organization's products, their aims and their policies are environmentally friendly when in reality, they're not particularly. Now others see CSR as just pure nonsense. Uh, they don't believe that companies have obligations beyond making good products and profit. And done poorly, CSR can be seen just as lip service, you know, either overblown, fake, uh, or worse, an attempt to deceive the public. So some affluents see CSR as simply a marketing gimmick, uh, something that's used to make people feel better about the products and services they buy, but without a real commitment to making the world better. So, you know, in a nutshell, I think this person sums up the benefits and pitfalls of CSR policy. In its purest form, CSR embodies everything 
a company produces, how they source materials, how they treat people, um, and the legacy that they ultimately leave. Uh, to some, it, it's a worthy, but frankly, impossibly high standard, uh, one that companies espouse more than they live. So now that we've heard some of the top of mind comments, let's dig a little deeper into the critical components that, that make up positive corporate social responsibility. Uh, and what we find is that there's no single factor that is most important to strong CSR, but rather it's made up of many individual pieces. You know, how a company treats its employees of a is of paramount importance, especially among working affluents who may be seeing this through their, the lens of their own experiences. They're more than twice as likely as non-working affluents to select this as a most important aspect of CSR. Now it's closely followed by the need for companies to be honest and transparent, both in their operations and their communications. Some of the other factors that come into play uh, that play into uh, a sound policy are things like giving back to the community, being environmentally sensitive, ensuring a diverse and inclusive workforce, uh, as well as providing equal pay for women. 30% of affluents claim that that's an important aspect. You know, unfortunately, uh, that really belies the stark difference between men and women. So 38% of affluent women say that equal pay policies are an important aspect um, compared to only 22% of affluent men. So, you know, this is one of the areas where we find discordant opinions between the genders. Um, we're going to get uh, further, uh, we're going to get into some further detail in a little bit. Uh, but right now, what I wanted to do is talk about um, the fact that CSR is applicable to all Americans, both affluent and non-affluent. We actually see a significant agreement in the importance of many of those aspects, you know, particularly that companies be open and honest with the public. So climate change, community involvement, fair trade supply chain are equally important, of equal importance to both affluent and non-affluent Americans. However, uh, we do see some, uh, some big differences between the groups. Non-affluents rate employing differently abled people uh, and valuing human relationships much higher than affluent Americans. They're much more likely to look at the company's green policies, their philanthropy, uh, and whether or not they're using ethically sourced materials as a sign of good corporate citizenship. So while being a good corporate citizen is critically important, it must be backed up by good, solid products and services. Uh, so when we talk to them, three quarters of affluents say they're more likely to recommend a company's products if they perceive the company to be open and honest. Now, we found that almost two thirds of them say they care more about the quality of the company's products and services um, than they do about the company's community outreach. So this is really saying that you know, the bottom line here is that the minimum price of entry is having a good solid product or service um, and good corporate uh, responsibility cannot overcome slipshoddy products. So you know, it's not one masking the other. You know, however, you know, at the same time, we do see that many affluents still want companies to be good corporate citizens, you know, above and beyond just making those good products. So, you know, 32% of them are disagreeing with the statement that if a company makes good products, um, that they don't care if they're good corporate citizens. So what we're really seeing uh, are a large number of people who are simply saying, yes, it is important. Now, on the positive side, half of all affluents say that they're willing to pay more for products if the company supports their community, if the products are environmentally sound, or if the brand is socially conscious. So brands that emphasize these qualities may be able to actually charge premiums for doing the right thing in those consumers' minds. 
Now, there is a difference in how affluents look at durable goods, things like appliances and consumer electronics, compared to how they view non-durable goods like apparel and food products. Uh, with durable goods, we find that the single most important element um, that people want to consider are things like energy efficiency, you know, which frankly may say more about the affluent's desire for lower utility bills than their specific environmental consciousness. However, a little bit more than a third of them say reducing impact on the environment is most important, followed by dis in, uh, in descending order by eco-friendly products, water saving, and being socially responsible. One in five affluents stress the importance of fair trade and ethically sourced material. You know, so as you can see, there's a lot of factors that are going into the image that these companies are portraying. Now, as we look at non-durable goods, there's really no strong number one preference, but, but rather a crowd of characteristics uh, that huddle together in the list of importance. So energy efficiency falls from 57% with durable goods to a mere 24% here. Um, and considerations such as reducing environmental impact, being eco-friendly, um, and those levels are, are really pretty close behind. Um, this likely says more about the perception that items like food and clothing somehow pose a less serious environmental and societal concern than do things like durable goods. So related to those perceptions, uh, we asked affluents to rate the importance of sound corporate social responsibility for 23 different in industries. And that ranged you know, everywhere from uh, apparel to major appliance manufacturers, cosmetics to social media. You know, of the 23 industries, 49% of affluents feel that it is extremely important for healthcare companies to be socially responsible. Um, and that also had an additional 35% saying that it's somewhat important for them. Uh, now, home furnishing companies were the least likely to need to be socially responsible, uh, at least according to affluence, with fewer than one in five saying that it was extremely important. So we don't often see the view of the world um, as similar for both men and women. Uh, and while there are clear errors of, of commonality, uh, we also find that there are significant differences uh, between how the genders look at things. But first, we want to point out that there is some commonality, and, and three quarters of both women and men say they're more likely to recommend a product if the company is honest and transparent. Uh, so there's great consensus here. They both cite this quality among the top two attributes of corporate social responsibility. Now, however, women are far more likely to place value on good corporate citizenship um, and the, the softer, more emotional side. And they're willing to, though, pay premiums to support those companies if they believe that they're pursuing the right policies. Almost two thirds of uh, affluent women say that they would rather buy from a company that actively supports their community, even if it would be more expensive. And that's fully 14 percentage points higher than men. And nearly six out of 10 women also say that they'd be willing to pay more for a brand that is socially conscious, a full 20 percentage points higher than men. You know, I, I should point out that there's still a goodly number of men who agree with those statements, uh, but really it pales in comparison to the number of women. Now, on the other hand, what we see uh, with men are that they're, they're somewhat more likely to view things from a utilitarian perspective. So two thirds of men say that they care more about the quality of a company's products and services than their community outreach. And that's nine percentage points higher than women. Uh, they're also 10 percentage points more likely to say that if a company makes good quality products, they don't care if they're good corporate citizens. 
Now, given women's greater likelihood and willingness to pay more for responsible companies' products, um, I think anyone that is selling products that are normally purchased by women should really pay heed to these leanings. Uh, in the end, uh, they may be able to offset the additional costs of being a responsible uh, company through higher prices. You know, providing that the claims are valid uh, and they're not simply seen as marketing messages. You know, we go back to the um, the green sheen uh, that I mentioned before. They have to be real. They have to be uh, things that people can actually see. Um, and while only four in ten men feel the same way, that still represents a significant market opportunity. So given the differences in how men and women feel about corporate social responsibility, it's really not surprising to see that across the board, women are holding companies to a much higher standard than men do. You know, even the lowest rated industry, which is uh, home furnishings and decorating, you know, even that industry is more than twice as high for women compared to men. Um, in viewing healthcare, the highest industry, women are 17 percentage points higher in rating it as extremely important compared to their male counterparts. So given all of this, you know, you might ask, okay, well, just how many companies are perceived, you know, as being socially responsible or corporately socially responsible? Um, and, and sadly, um, one in four affluents believe that it's fewer than 25% of all companies that are responsible. Uh, an additional 36% believe that that figure is somewhere between 25 and 50%. Uh, but the fact of the matter remains that 60% of affluents think that fewer than half of the companies out there are responsible. Uh, the level is the same for both men and women. Uh, and just, you know, frankly, this just means that there's a lot of work to be done for companies to be seen as good corporate citizens. Now, for some time, we've been watching generational transitions among affluents. Um, you know, as we look at the survey year over year, uh, there are changes that are, you know, that are clearly taking place as time marches on. Uh, Generation Z didn't even qualify to be part of our adult affluent data until 2015. Uh, but today, they represent one in eight affluents. Uh, coupled with their next generation counterparts with millennials, they account for slightly more than a third of all affluent adults. Uh, now, given the different attitudes that these younger generations espouse, companies are going to need to pay attention as these younger generations become a more dominant part of the affluent population. So, you know, there's a reasonable agreement across the generations about some of the important qualities of corporate responsibility, um, as well as some clear differences. Uh, Gen Z and millennials care most about the fair treatment of employees in sharp contrast to their Gen X counterparts. Interestingly, uh, boomers and seniors also rate concerns for fair treatment high on their list of concerns. Uh, and this really could be driven by the fact that both ends of the employee age spectrum are experiencing their own issues. So for the youngest, it's about starting their careers in a difficult environment. And for the oldest, it's more about hanging on to their careers as they prepare for retirement. Gen X, who's in the middle of their careers, may be feeling less pressure and see employee treatment as less of an issue simply because they're feeling more secure than either of the, uh, the other generations. Now, workplace diversity uh, is seen as less important to the youngest generations, uh, but I believe that that Happen, or that's happening because so many of them are in employee peer groups at their companies that they're in fact already pretty diverse and inclusive. So as we look at this, there are, you know, there are three issues that are likely to grow in importance. Um, and that is, you know, as these younger generations become more dominant in the affluent population, equal pay for women, 
a po- you're having a positive impact on climate and making sure that you have ethically sourced materials. So, you know, companies would do well to keep these goals in mind as, as they look towards the future, even though they may not seem that important today, they're going to be as these younger generations get older and become more important. So with that in mind, you know, we wanted to look at um, how the generations are attuned to social responsibility. Uh, Companies need to be mindful that these younger generations have a very different mindset uh, about the things that are important to them and the things that they're going to support with their hard-earned money and their wallets. So in every case of a, you know, quote unquote, willingness to pay more for responsible products, Uh, The majority of Gen Z and millennials are already on board. You know, this is important to them. Uh, And it's apparent in things, you know, such as supporting their community, being environmentally friendly, being socially conscious. Uh, And certainly compared to the oldest generations, these differences are, are quite dramatic. So the support of responsible, uh, responsible companies doesn't stop it, you know, just in the marketplace. It's not just about buying their products because almost half of all Gen Z and millennials say that they're currently investing in green companies. You know, a little bit over a third of them say that they regularly investigate Uh, the environmental or social record of companies. To them, companies must be more than just manufacturers. They want a social contract to be part of their engagement with these companies. Now, you can really see the differences in generations uh, in the qualities they look for when purchasing non-durables. You know, again, these are things such as food, clothing, cosmetics, and cleaning products. Uh, more than any other generation, they rate eco-friendly, socially responsible, and organic goods to be most important when they're making purchasing decisions. Now, like so many things in our country, uh, we see divisions in people's perceptions of corporate and social responsibility that are correlated with their political beliefs. Uh, thankfully, there are areas of agreement where we can pull us together, uh, but there are clear differences that companies should pay attention to uh, in order to prevent alienating people. Uh, and those differences are evident in both the section of the country one lives, uh, as well as in the political party membership. First, let's take a look at the qualities of social responsibility by region. Uh, in the Midwest, where there's a great deal of the economy that is manufacturing based, uh, we see the highest concerns about fair treatment of employees. Now, honesty and transparency are highest on the two coasts, uh, and environmental concerns peak in the Northeast and dip in the Midwest. And, you know, again, I think it's um, a lot has to do with the uh, the type of industry and companies that are in those regions. Uh, The Midwest is also the least likely to voice concerns about equal pay for women. And that can be because of unions in the Midwest that are enforcing these kinds of things. Um, But that said, you know, we certainly do see regional differences um, that, you know, can come into play uh, based on how the company is setting up their, their corporate social responsibility. Now, it's safe to say that employee treatment, honesty, transparency are ideals that that really cross the political divide. Uh, And then there are close levels of agreement with things like community involvement, valuing human relationships. Now, it should be noted that political endorsements are universally unpopular, regardless of whether the person is liberal, middle of the road or conservative in their political leanings. Now, nowhere <laughs> where we find differences um, are that we see liberals are much more likely to favor green policies, workplace diversity, ethically sourced materials, you know, far more than their conservative counterparts. Uh, 
Uh, on the other hand, support for military veterans is one of the areas where conservatives are more concerned than their political counterparts. Okay, so how do companies navigate the political divide? Well, you know, it clearly requires nuance. Uh, more than four in 10 Republicans view corporate social responsibility simply as a marketing gimmick. Uh, they're twice as likely to be cynical about it uh, compared to their Democratic counterparts. Uh, and similarly, Democrats are twice as likely to simply disagree with that statement compared to Republicans. Um, so, you know, obviously the question is, where is, where is the sweet spot? Um, common ground can be found in focusing on being seen as open, honest, transparent, as much as you can be. You know, as we saw earlier, honesty and transparency are top qualities that both political parties see in a positive light. And that flows through to promoting your company if they see your policies are open and above board. So regardless of someone's political party, a significant majority of all political affiliations say that they're likely to recommend a product if the company is honest and transparent. But coming back to actual spending, uh, we do see a difference in how Democrats and Republicans value brands that seem socially conscious. Almost six in 10 Democrats agree that they're willing to pay more for those brands, while only a third of Republicans feel the same way. So I know we've presented a lot of material today. Um, and, you know, as you can imagine, it's really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we're always happy to talk to you guys in greater detail if you'd like. Um, but for right now, let me try to condense the most salient points that I'd like you to take away today. So we see four key areas that we think are most important on the subject of corporate social responsibility. The first is the recognition of being seen as a good corporate citizen. Can, that can actually deliver better profits. It shouldn't be seen as simply a cost without any real benefit. You know, the fact is that many people are willing to pay a premium for products from companies that they deem are righteous in their, in their motives. Uh, this is particularly true for women and for younger generations as a whole. So this kind of emphasis um, can, have, can pay dividends, uh, both in terms of uh, the number of people who, are, who will consider your product, as well as the price that they're willing to pay. Now, moving forward, you know, as we look at the future of CSR, you know, we predict the qualities such as pursuing green policies, supporting social change will become even more important as Gen Z and millennials become the dominant part of the affluent population. You know, make no mistake, these younger affluents are expecting companies to be accountable um, and to upholding these facets of the business. Uh, so you have to be real here. You can't fake it. You know, and as important as we believe CSR and, and will be moving forward, you know, we've got to emphasize that people approach it in a sincere fashion. If it's seen as self-serving or fake, uh, cynicism about the company's policy is likely going to overtake these efforts and potentially backfire. So company actions, you know, they have to align with their public relations efforts uh, or you're gonna see serious repercussions. It's no longer enough to acknowledge things like Black History Month or Pride Month. You know, these types of outreach or recognition must be evident all year long uh, in the programs that a company keeps both internally and externally. Uh, you know, it's a hackneyed sta statement, but the truth is you can't just talk the talk. You really do need to walk the walk. People will see through um, your, whether your policies are real or whether they're just simply PR. 
And of course, all of this needs to be considered in the political landscape uh, that we find ourselves in today. You know, there are certainly divisive elements uh, that are going to make it difficult to navigate. You know, clearly political contributions um, can be a minefield uh, and to a lesser degree, social causes and things like fair trade policies can be seen by some as, as unpleasant qualities for companies. Um, but we do know that commonality exists um, and that some qualities transcend politics. Uh, but above all else, uh, companies need to strive to be honest and transparent. They need to treat their employees well. And, and those are the qualities that are going to take them far. So I want to thank you again for your time today. Um, you know, I, I think we've kind of went our entire uh, time period. So uh, if there are questions, uh, then what I'll do is I'll make sure to get back to you personally. Uh, in the meantime, if you do have questions that you haven't raised through the chat box, please feel free to reach out to us for further insight on corporate social responsibility or, or frankly, any other topic pertaining to affluent Americans. Uh, we're there to help. So thank you and have a great day. That's really a fantastic presentation, Tony. I found that um, really relevant and really timely. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Be on the lookout for an email with a direct link to today's recorded presentation. And as Tony said, please reach out to us at any time. That now concludes today's webinar. Have a wonderful day.